let's break this down a little bit because you you referenced a couple of times is it's like a movie script. You know, you get to play <laughs> back in your hometown. And the script would have said if it was Hollywood, that first game back, you would have gone four for four. You know, and you just had a monster game. But you said it, you went 0 for 4, four strikeouts. What was going on in your head after all this time, all this work, you played up this whole thing, and then right out of the gate is instant failure. What was that like after that first game? What was going on in your head? What kind of jerky is that? Uh, it's called Archer. Oh yeah, that's literally the kind that I was just eating. Okay, <laughs> I don't nice. know. If, I don't know if it reaches Vegas, but in Los Angeles, there's a place called Gelson's. Gelson's. Oh, is that the one? You from ever heard of that? The from the. Uh, you ever heard of that, Drew? Uh huh. It's the best beef jerky I've ever tasted. Really? And it's some grocery store out in California. I, I guess it's only in they California. Put I've never it, heard they, of it. Is that the one that they put in your bag? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get that in mine. You I didn't got, get that? No, I got like pistachios. They had a, they had a, a, they had a yeah. supermarket, whatever you call it, across the street from our hotel. Uh-huh. It was Walmart. Uh, no, uh, it was a Jelson's. Or was Gelson, it? Yes. And I went and got like nine more bags. Oh, that's where heads up. got water, same spot. <laughs> yeah. So heads up, oh, man. Really we good. were just out in Southern California with our company, um, like a little retreat down in like Orange County. And uh, Ben apparently went and found the best beef jerky and kept it to himself. Yeah, I'm pretty selfish. Until after we left. <laughs> <laughs> I've got six we're, bags. I don't know what's wrong with you. We're, we're literally on the plane back from, from L.A. He's like, hey, do you all hear this jerky? Did you guys get some? No, no, no. I didn't get any of my bag. Oh, my gosh. All week, it's been the best thing I've ever eaten. Oh, thanks for telling us now, yeah, man. I don't know why you didn't get it. It's good. Uh, I'll just check it out. I'm, I'm a huge beef jerky. Have you yeah, had? Like, almost every day. Yeah. Have you had? Uh, the Biltong. Tyler's an investor, so if you don't want to buy it, don't I'm, worry about it. I'm not an investor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an investor. It's, they're a client. Have you ever had? <laughs> it's called. <laughs> it's. <laughs> I have, but I, I think I tried it because there was like whoever the spokesperson was. I think this is the same company, but I think I'm pretty sure I've tried that one. Uh huh. Yeah, it's good. I like it. You like it too, don't it's lie. A, it's a meat snack. It's not a beef jerky. Yeah, don't call it beef oh, jerky. It's, it's biltong. It's biltong. It's biltong. It's a meat. It snack. is good. I'm not. I'm it just. I'm just busting your balls. It's just a different process how they cure. Oh. How they cure the meat, and it supposedly retains more protein and oh. less sugar and stuff like that oh. than beef jerky. Yeah. yeah. Supposedly. Yeah. Oh. All right. And if you're wondering who the voice on the other line is. We're recording, boys. What? Oh, are we? I didn't know we were we're going. going. Hold on. Oh my Scratch God. that out. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> he hasn't paid for any airtime. <laughs> no, scratch that out. Hey, David, here's what you do. Every time we say <laughs> you believe it out. Oh, uh, <laughs> the one shot. <laughs> Have you ever had one shot podcast? <laughs> it's his meat. It's dried. It's high protein, low sugar. You should try one shot <laughs> podcast. <laughs> But uh, the voice that you hear on the other end is none other than Drew Robinson. And if you haven't yet listened to episode 105, mm. pause this episode right now. Go back and listen to episode 105. Drew is our first ever repeat guest mm -hmm. because that's how awesome the conversation was. That's how impactful the conversation mm -hmm. was. And Drew, I'm going to get awkward for a second here. Before you do, before you do, okay. for those of you who are still listening, pause this and do what Ben just <laughs> said. Go back to that episode. Episode 105. 105. Listen to that and then come back to this yes. point. Yes, and come back to this. But like I said, I'm going to get awkward with you real quick. So one of the most common questions that I get asked, and I'm sure you guys do too, since doing this podcast is, okay, who's your favorite guest? Mm -hmm. You get to talk to, you know, so many different guys, so many different celebrities, who is your favorite guest? And Drew, I'm not, as God is my witness, every single time, my answer is Drew Robinson. Mm -hmm. Let's because go. because mm -hmm. the, the conversation that we had is still, like, I still, I still feel it. Yeah, it changed him. It, it, it really it, did. It changed us all. It actually. changed us all, for yeah. sure. Uh, but but wow. for real, like, he's not making that up. No, that, that's legit. Like, it's, it's to the point where, like, people will ask and we just now are like, well, his is Drew Robinson. <laughs> and then so ours and ours changes every time, yeah, yeah. every right. single time. It's like, oh, who, who did we interview last? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Drew, Drew's for sure there, but yeah. I think it's it. And, and literally every single time, but 
if you talked to Ben within probably two weeks of that interview, you could see that something in his Fair mind fun. was still processing, mm -hmm. right? He was still just like walking through like that interview and the impact, just, you know, the things that you went through, the things that you overcame, just the story of, of tragedy and triumph, man, just all together in one episode. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it really was, wow. gosh, it was amazing. And then what, and, and, and la last weird thing I'll say is I don't re-listen to our episodes uh -huh. at all. I've listened to that episode four times, mm. literally. Yeah. And every single time I get something different. So again, yeah. if you haven't heard episode 105, pause this right now. Stop being stubborn. Go, go back. back and listen because his story will, I mean, this was a year ago. You. Yeah. It's yeah. Still, well, Drew, how have you been? Practice. Yeah, man. Seriously. How you been? Well, damn, I appreciate that boys. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's some fuel for the soul right there. Um, I had, I honestly, it was, it was, the feelings mutual. I remember, I remember when I got done with that, I like got off the, got off the call and told my family, got told Diane, I was like, cause at that time I, everything was still so new. Right. So mm -hmm. like I was still having a, not a hard time, but I was still kind of like learning to articulate my thoughts and my reflections and my, th everything involved with my story. I was still kind of learning. I remember I got off the, got off the call and I told Diane, I was like, man, that was by far the most like candid, the most like clear reflect reflections I've, I've done to that point. So mm -hmm. I remember I got done and I also like felt like kind of felt it from that interview too. And in, in that episode, so feelings mutual, but uh, for what I've been up to, man, I've been kind of doing a little bit of everything. I'm just like, not a little bit of everything, but I've just been like a little all over um, just cause it's been the off season. So I've tried to take advantage of some free time, um, more downtime than I usually do. than I usually have in the off season mm -hmm. uh, since I'm not going to be playing this year. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've been just trying to like really stay connected with people, try to get my feet wet with all the different kinds of uh, different areas in life. So um, it's been really cool to just kind mm -hmm. of experiment and start to kind of find my way in this uh, this realm of the world without yeah. being an athlete, without having the the uh, the athlete attached to my name yeah. anymore. So walk us through that, man. So when we spoke last, man, you were making your comeback, right? And you were coming back, and you were going to play, and. You, you got back in and literally, I think it was like a week or two after the episode aired, you hit your first home run back in, right? It was like the first week you started playing, wasn't it? Yeah. So I was, I mean, so what, yeah, just walk us through that getting back in the game and what last, last season was like for you. Yeah, it was wild, man. I, it's, it's funny to think about really, because like, I kind of got back into baseball by accident, like. I don't know if I said it in the last episode, but I, I went to go say goodbye to baseball, um, to like go hit one more time, just to hit off the tee, just to get that feeling and like kind of close that chapter. And then I felt like I, it was okay. Like it felt kind of normal. So I was like, geez, am I crazy to think I can make a comeback? So then I kind of like just loosely committed and just kind of kept on waiting until I reached my limit of like, okay, that, that's, that's it. I'm going to be able to get to this, get to the next step and then get to, to actually play. And then, it just like I was able to keep on making the adjustment and getting to spring training, obviously, and going through a regular spring training after everything that happened, after losing an eye, like having my teammates support me and just like, just kind of root me on really. And just like want what's best for me, want like want the best for me. It was just like the most, I don't know, the most touching, the most empowering feeling, best experience ever. Um, and then on top of that, being able to make the AAA team when I knew going into spring training, I, I, I had peaked at the schedule and seeing that AAA was opening up in Vegas, my hometown. Um, so that was like on my radar. And then when I found out I made that team, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is just, I'm living a, a freaking movie script, man. Like wow. I just can't, I can't, this is so out of my control, but I'm just like so happy to be along for the ride. And then, yeah, getting back in this, into the season, getting back into playing baseball after everything that happened, um, getting my first hit, like the first game, I'm not going to lie, was pretty awful. Like I went over four with four strikeouts. It was a nice taste of reality right off the bat, um, pun intended. And then uh, <laughs> get my first hit, like, third game. And then the last game in, in Vegas with everyone there, like, when I say everyone, I mean everyone, like my family, friends, a bunch of people that I had, like, known throughout my life, all the doctors that put me back together, my psychiatrist, like, so many people, part of me, my life were there, and I was able to run into one and, and hit a home run. It was just like, who is who is doing this for me? It's just like, right. I got I was bawling, running around the bases. I looked, hit home plate, like looked up, and of course, out of everyone in the stands, I just, of course, lock eyes with Diana and then my dad right after. And I'm just like, 
dude, this is, this is so much bigger than me. And I was and like, looking back, I've kind of goofed about it. Like maybe I should have just pulled, pulled like a, a, a water boy, Bobby Boucher moment and just kept on running off the field because I, it wouldn't, <laughs> it wasn't going to get any better than that. Um, and it, like I said, it was just like the most meaningful, just kind of like full circle thing that honestly, if someone would have wrote that, wrote that script down on paper before and said, this is what I was going to be able to get to experience. I would have been like, All right, just chill. That's a little too, too like perfect of a thing. So um, like I said, I was just like totally, I don't know, humbled and honored to be able to experience everything that I did. Yeah. So let's break this down a little bit because you, you referenced a couple of times. It was, it's like a movie script, you know, you get to play <laughs> back in your hometown and the script would have said if it was Hollywood, that first game back, you would have gone four for four, you know, and you just had a monster game. But you said it, you went 0 for four, four strikeouts. What was going on in your head after all this time, all this work, you played up this whole thing, and then right out of the gate is instant failure. What was that like after that first game? What was going on in your head? Yeah, it was tough. Um, I had, I mean, to be honest, I struggled pretty pretty bad in, in spring training as well. Like I went through, even though spring training short, I went through a couple phases where like, I just didn't make contact. So I had gotten a taste of that a little bit beforehand, but yeah, going into the first game with everything, all the, I don't know, the publicity attached to my story and people knowing I was playing in Vegas. So like having that hype attached to it, like I went into the game a hundred percent convinced I was going to hit a home run first pitch I saw. Like mm. I was convinced that I was going to go that way. And when it didn't, I also had ESPN there filming to like to add on to um, the documentary. So I just had all these eyes on me. And I, like I said, I just was like, this is so out of my hands. Like I'm just going to hit a home run and I'm just going to get, I'm going to have a really good game. It's going to, everything's going to come full circle. And then I did it. And like, there was a couple of times in the game, I was just like so embarrassed and like went down the road of like, all right, well, people are happy. I'm still alive, but I'm like totally a charity case out here. Like I didn't, I don't deserve to be here. Like I'm not good enough to be here. Mm. Um, this is embarrassing. Like I, I got a couple pitches that were like meatballs, like right down the middle where I was like, if anyone, anyone else in the, was in the box, they would have crushed that pitch. So like I went down that whole road and it was like, after the game I had before going into the game, I had an interview scheduled with ESPN to do like a post first game type reflection. And like for after the third strikeout, like going in my last about, I was like, if I don't make contact here, I'm not doing this interview, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just going to go back and, sneak off into the, to the, to the hotel and I'll try again tomorrow. Um, but actually went up, struck out and I was just like going through the motions. Like, this is so embarrassing. And then I just like had to reel myself in and realize like as charity case, as it might have felt in my head, like literally just being out there was a win. And like, that's mm, something that mm. it didn't feel necessarily genuine. Like, like my whole body didn't feel that genuine, like the, how genuine that actually was. But, I was trying to tap into that. And that was just kind of like, I was able to step back after the game and realize that like those realizations and those reflections and those thoughts would never have happened the year prior. Like I just would have said, this game is unacceptable. Um, you're a failure. Like you're embarrassing yourself. You're embarrassing all the people that have put the work in for you. And like, I just wouldn't let myself have any kind of moment of grace, but I had that like little spark of like, it's okay to be, it's okay. Like, just being here is okay. Like yeah. people still believe in you. Um, my teammates are still proud of me, like for being out here and like everyone in the crowd that was here to see me was literally just happy to see me playing baseball again. Um, and like I said, it wasn't like my whole body wasn't feeling how genuine that actually was, but mm -hmm. a big part of me was. Yeah. And I kind of like was able to sit back and realize that that was like a, a sign of some growth that had happened in that year um, yeah. since my incident because like I said that th that moment of forgiveness would never have happened in my head um, the season before so Dude, did you, did you let me I, did you did you end up doing the interview oh yeah yeah so that's what I was also getting out of like I put my pride to the side and went and did the interview and I actually was like able to talk about this like the same way I just answered that and I was like actually able to like voice it and hear it like literally hear it come out of my mouth like that kind of reinforced the idea yeah. that um, I have had some growth um, up to this point, even though it was like a big part of me still felt embarrassed and felt like a failure. There was also a part of me that was like allowing myself to learn, know that like, this is just a part of the process. There's a growing phase that's, or a growing pain phase that's going to happen um, with this. And even when I had two eyes, I still had games where I struck out four times. So like what really, yeah. what are you comparing? Yeah. yeah. So, Dude, um, I, I forced have out like an external reflection, um, which allowed me to kind of like give myself some grace, which again, 
I never was able to do that in my life before that. Man, and baseball is is a sport, and in and, and all sports, th- there's an element of this, but baseball is a sport that your mental attitude has such an impact, mm-hmm. right? And and you can either uh, you can either control it and come back from maybe a setback, or it just snowballs more and more. So you, you talked about, okay, now being able to step back, right? And then, yeah, you didn't have a hit in the second game, but in the third game you did. But talk about you having these conversations now with some of these younger players, and we'll get more into what you're doing now, but but how important that is. Because in football, too, like it just when you're having a bad game and then you're in your head and you're like, oh, if I strike out, if you just start thinking the the possibility of I'm going to get burnt deep. Lose confidence, yes, right? yes. It, it comes to fruition. Yes. And, and in life, it's like, oh, man, I, I don't deserve this deal or I'm not going to get this deal. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't like it literally like when you speak positively when you reinforce like the positive outcomes the likelihood of that happening and you changing the trajectory of whatever situation you're in yeah. it is so real that mental power is so you know real. what really gets that's why i asked did you do the interview afterwards because there's so many of us as athletes that we have a bad day or a bad game and when we have a good game, we're right in front of those cameras. Yeah. Hit a home run. I, you know, I got two interceptions. Yeah, you're in front of that camera. You have a bad game, and you're, you don't want to talk to the camera. You don't want to talk to anyone, no interviews or anything. And that, starts, that speaks to your character, who you, who you are. You just went through a situation where you went 0-4, and, and you got in front of that camera. And here's where the growth is. You hear yourself talking to the camera. And you know it's all, it was negative, 0 and 4. But once you verbally start to talk, it's the soothing part of that. That's soothing. It was always soothing to me. We lose a game, I get in front of the camera, had a, my worst game of my life, get in front of the camera, and it's like, okay, I just let this out. I verbally hmm. talked about this. And it's almost like it's therapeutic in that yeah. situation. Yeah, that's like exactly what it feels like. And that's what I've been. That's, that's probably like the biggest uh, blessing in disguise with, with everything being so public with, with my story and my, and just everything is because I've been able to just keep talking about it. And like, yeah. for me, like you said, it's very therapeutic. And every time I sit, I get in front of an audience or get on a, on one of these and just talk about it, like I forced, it's almost like an accountability partner. Yeah. Like it's, it's literally just like, it forces me to be accountable with, my words and like mm-hmm. it's really easy to like sit up here and talk about these things but the more i talk about it the more it like reinforces and forces me to like walk the walk as well when i get off the camera and go back and do the thing so like it forces me to be accountable and then also just like like i said the, just the blunt reality of saying things out loud yeah, because yeah. internally irrational thoughts and irrational feelings can seem justified internally because you don't have like the accountability or you sometimes it's just that like you don't even hear it so like thinking irrationally internally can feel justified at times. But when you say it out loud, you're like, that doesn't really need to make any sense. That happens to me all the time. Like yeah. in my therapy, yeah. Yeah. I'll start saying how I'm feeling throughout the week. And then I'll say like, I don't actually think that way. I don't right. actually feel that. Way. It's like just hearing it out loud for some reason um, allows me to kind of like reevaluate and readjust and just kind of like um, reinforce some of the more positive perspective things or the more realistic perspectives um, attached to any kind of situation that I just went through. But even the idea of, of you said, look, after that game, you said, oh, I don't believe, I don't believe that I deserve to be here and this, but then when you caught yourself and you're like, wait a minute, no, like mm-hmm. I do belong here. I'm right. not a charity case. I'm this. And you said, you said something you're like, I didn't even wholeheartedly believe it. But when you start speaking life into yourself, mm-hmm. whether you believe it wholeheartedly or not, that does move you in the right direction. It's that whole fake yeah. it till you make it type yeah. of idea. You know, I think of yeah. like super highly successful people mm-hmm. and like you're like, how does that clown have what he has and got to where he got? <laughs> that dude is is a clown. clown. Exactly. But you're like, but those are the type of people that say, hey, I deserve to be here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. And they're speaking life into themselves. So, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's how you get over that. And that's how you continue to progress. But if that same guy were to be like, you don't deserve it. You know, you're an idiot. Like you're a clown, like you're a screw up. You're this, you're that. Like they would never be there. That's, I mean, that's a huge differentiator. I think in, in highly motivated and successful people versus the others. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like the, like life in general and then sports specifically and like baseball specifically, it's like, 
everything is so it's so much a momentum game like in everything again you can take back take away baseball you can take away sports and just but just life in general like the more momentum you're creating towards positivity or towards opportunity or towards whatever um goal you're after like the more momentum you create the more realistic it's going to happen it's going to it's going to come out so like it's just so true like the more you think about it the more it's going to be like on your mind which means you probably notice something out in, in reality attached to that more often it's just like the same thing like when you're looking when you're going through the search of buying a new car and you start like looking up models you start you see that model of car everywhere yeah um, and like <laughs> the white ford like, raptor <laughs> <laughs> the idea of bringing things to your attention so um that's like it's so true and i think that's something that like i said i, I just I, I was never aware of like i was doing that just in a very negative way before my incident and that's why i was like totally convinced that I mean, there was times I was in a baseball, on a baseball field, in the in center field, in a major league game, playing in the game, like totally convinced I wasn't that good at baseball. Mm -hmm. So it's just like these yeah. these stories that you like are able to convince that's yourself tough. of. Yeah. And again, I think it's the separators internally, and that's why I'm such a believer in my therapy and just like conversation in general now, um, because it's, it forces you to get things out of your mind and out of your chat, off your chest. Um, and I think it's like one, it starts with like you hear. The, the how unrealistic it is and then two it like when you say things out loud that's like the first step of like finding some accountability which kind of forces you to walk the walk i want to take a quick break and thank our partners sleep number and highlight a couple things they're doing guys these sleep number beds are unreal the technology that they've created the feedback that it gives you on your sleep. I've got the app opened up right here. They tell you things like your heart rate, your heart rate variability, your breathing rate, all these type uh, metrics and feedback to give you so that you can improve your quality of sleep. They're all over the place. You can go and check yourself out a sleep number store, wherever you live, go to sleepnumber.com as well. They've got great resources on there. We just talked about this not too long ago. They have a whole blog section, all these articles, things that you can improve your health. Sleep number is definitely changing the game when it comes to betting. So get yourself the sleep number, get yourself to sleepnumber.com and check them out. Now back to the episode. Yeah, you've said accountability a couple times, and I guess it's hard enough to go in and compete and try to be successful in baseball. And on top of that, you're now adding the accountability, as you say, of millions of people watching what Drew Robinson's trying to accomplish here. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that you're trying to do this with one eye, so most people are trying to do this with two eyes. You got one. So you got all this pressure on you. I'm just curious what that season, like going into the season, what did success look like for you? What would have constituted a successful year knowing all these different things that you got to, to, uh, to balance yeah, there? What was it going in and then maybe looking back? What would you consider yeah. it? Yeah, I really like that question. That forces a really good reflection because <clears throat> I'll be honest, that like going into it, my expectations were just way too high. Like, again, I, I just battled the idea that <clears throat> I was going to be, that I was a charity case. So like I, I had, there's a big part of me that thought that the giants would give me the opportunity because it's publicity and it's just like a really cool story. And again, like going to like feeding into the charity case type um, notion. So that, and then, like I said, I, I, I just wanted to be, I, I also generally believe that I was as good as I was with one eye. Um, or I was as good as I was with two eyes because one, I didn't know the difference now. So like I could, it's not like people, two eyes, they can go and close one eye and then try to hit and realize how difficult it was. Like I was forced to figure out everything up to that point with one eye. And like, I wasn't able to compare what it was like with one eye to two eyes. like this, that was just all I knew. So things looked similar. Like it looked mm. the same to me and it felt the same to me. Um, so I genuinely believed I was going to be the same player. And there was times where I was just like, this has nothing to do with one eye or two eyes. This is just like, I created a bad habit in my swing or created a, something bad mechanically, mm. whatever. So there was like the expectation that I like, nothing was going to change. Um, which looking back, it just wasn't fair to myself. Like that's a really good thing. Like I, it, I'm not saying I should have just went in and been like happy to be there. Like, go, like whatever, whatever happens happens. Um, cause I think that could have led to some complacency, mm. but I just, I was, now that I'm able to look back, I realized just being able to go and play in games and get some hits and, and yeah. make some really good plays on defense and like 
everything besides swing the swing and miss rate, which again, comparatively, I was a swing and miss guy with two eyes. So like I was kind of doing what I did anyways. I just, it was a little bit more on the swing and miss side at, at, at sitting, but like I was still a really good defender. I was still, I had my above average speed. I had a really good arm. So like all the other things came out pretty similarly, but because I had really high expectations, there was definitely times where I fought myself where I was like, dude, this is just embarrassing. Like you need to, you need to, like there was time I was really close to retiring like a month into the season mm. because again, I was embarrassed. And I also did get to experience like the highest of highs in Vegas. And I was like, that's not, I'm just not going to top it. Like I feel like I completed what I wanted to do. Um, but I, again, I just like my expectations were just a little, just through the roof where, and again, I don't think I needed to tone them back completely because I didn't want to, I don't want to be complacent, but having just a little bit of balance where I was like, dude, you're lucky to even just be able to like be walking around and like functioning normally without having assistance. And now you get to like go and at least try to be a good baseball player. Like that was a perspective that I tried to like, tried really hard to reinforce. Um, and again, like in the moment I didn't, it wasn't really as easy for me to do that because I was still failing statistically. Um, but then afterwards, once I retired, I like, I have no regrets and I have no, like, there's not a part of me that's like, I, I, I did it too soon or anything. So like, I, I just have like a genuine peace within me. Like I got to play baseball again. It didn't go great statistically, but like, I still had a couple moments here. I had like three home runs. Like who's gotten to say that in pro ball, they hit three home runs with one eye. Who's gotten to say they played any games really at the triple A level. And then also like throughout the whole time, I think the coolest thing was just like a different like dialogue of conversations that I was able yeah. to have with my teammates, with my coaches, with mm. like, media and like i feel like i had it i genuinely feel like i had an impact on people's like like life <laughs> so, yeah uh, yeah you absolutely and that's did. hard to recognize in the moment right because being a competitor right you're you're trying to say hey i need to impact the team on the field or you know on on the diamond what do, i don't know what y'all say in baseball but but whatever it, it make, make an impact right statistically like you're talking about but <laughs> red flag <laughs> it's like darren say uh you know oh, you know oh. you know when you when you get a when you get a, you get a, a red touch, card when you, when you get a touchdown you know when you score a goal in it, baseball it's, it's like a minute ago when darren said i was oh and i was oh and four yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's oh four four or four you four. Just, you just lose. Excuse me, Mister Baseball. Just four games, Mr. Softball player over here. Now, I'm no expert because, like, like Drew, I did a lot of swing and miss with two eyes as well. <laughs> but, but really though, like to have that perspective of, hey, the impact that I'm making on the team is more than just what I'm doing at the plate, right? And what I'm doing, you know, out in the field. It's I'm I'm literally impacting and having conversations with guys. You know, yes, like you want to obviously impact that season, but what I could be doing to plant a seed with someone that could make an impact in this organization or another organization in three years, in five years, what they can do in their family 10, 15, 20 years from now. So it's it's hard to recognize that, right? In this arena, in, you know, in the sports arena, it's, it's hard. But we man, I hope that you did while you were there, at least a little bit, like, hey, listen, like I, I realize the opportunity where I'm at, I'm going to play as hard as I can, you know, playing ball. But at the same time, it's just as important that I'm pouring into these guys, you know, uh, in, in the, what, what do you say? The clubhouse. clubhouse. <laughs> See, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. is, which is what you ultimately decided was right. You, you wanted to make an impact beyond the game. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that was like, I tried to, I did that as much as I could in the moment. Um, but, for me, it was a, it was another like lifestyle habit that I had to kind of like adjust and like take a lot, like use a lot of effort, effort to kind of, um, accept that because for me, like I had such low self-confidence that like before my incident that that didn't just like change overnight. I had to work on that. And so like, I say that because in the moment when I was struggling and not thinking I was like doing anything for the team or whatever, and I would try to remind myself that I'm offering a little bit more than just statistics. Like it was a little uncomfortably uncomfortable for me to think that way because it was like my low self confidence was like, dude, you have nothing to offer. Like, even if you, even with the story, even with this, like, like you still are not walking the walk or whatever. So like my self confidence issues and my insecurity with that aspect was still tough for me at times to like allow myself to really yeah. feel that I was having a full impact on my, on my team or the people yeah. I was talking to and things like that. So 
I say that like a little hesitant, hesitantly because like I was able to do it sometimes, but I also had a little bit of an internal battle because I was like, dude, get off your high horse. Like you're not, you're not Gandhi. You don't have it all figured out. <laughs> you're just like, <laughs> right. you're just, guys. So like I, I had that little bit of an internal conflict with the idea that I was impacting somebody because it's like a little uncomfortable for me to think that I like my old self to believe that like I can actually impact someone other than just like making them laugh, yeah. um, which is like what I was really good at before my incident. So yeah. that was like the, the, the battle that I was kind of facing at times. There's in a the moment. There's a the lie point. out there though that, and I, and I, I succumbed to this lie when I was playing was you have to be the best to have a voice, right? Yeah, you have yeah. to be the best on the team in the locker room. You have to be an impact guy in order to actually have a voice to like right, mentor to pour into guys. Doing something one way, a hundred percent of the time, then you're not actually that person. So like, yeah. if you're trying to be a positive person and if you ever feel negative feelings, it's like, Oh, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a phony. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the same thing being like a leader, if you are trying to do things right and you do something, you make a mistake, it's like, oh, I'm not able to be a leader because I made that mistake. So I think that's what sometimes have athletes or yeah, to athletes, but a lot of people fall in the trap of like, if you're not doing something all the way, then you don't get to get the credit for being that kind of person. Um, when you, when you fall a little bit short of that. That's right. 100%. So, so Drew, how did you, and, and I know we want to move on after this, but how, how did you deal with all the distractions, the media distractions going into this? Because everybody wanted to hear your story. Everybody knew your story. You know, what, how did you prepare yourself to move forward with all, with all these distractions? Yeah, that was tough at times um, because, like I said, sometimes I go into a, a an interview or go into something feeling embarrassed about the way I was playing or the way yeah. I was doing things and, like, the the story of being a, a cherry case. But um, I just did – that was something that was a little bit more genuine. Like, I actually felt able – like, I, was, I felt comfortable telling myself that, like, I just have a really rare opportunity mm -hmm. to help more people by just being, like – just talking openly about this stuff. So like, even though at times I felt like I was battling inside or I felt like down or I felt like I was having, starting to get sleep that slip back into some like negative thought patterns and bad self talk. I would try to remind myself that that is like the message. And that's why I'm able to like relate to people that are yeah. struggling with this topic because I know it, I know what it feels like. I know what it's like to put it to the side and act like it's not there and go and be a high functioning, high performing person, but it's still always there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I was able to really remind myself that like, I just have a really rare opportunity to talk about this for other people that don't necessarily get to see it talked about or hear it talked about, or like just remind even people that weren't like necessarily like immediately impacted by it, like by themselves or like um, someone closer to them, but just like maybe it can teach someone that like, everyone is going through something and just like, just use, I don't know, just use the, the platform I had. Basically you hear that phrase talked about a lot. So mm -hmm. I just, I was able to remind myself that I had a pretty rare opportunity to help people that felt the way I did. Um, and maybe, maybe even people I didn't know that they were feeling the way I did, because again, like there was times I just didn't even like, I wasn't even aware. Like I didn't have the, the capacity the mental capacity to understand why I was feeling the way I was feeling, mm -hmm. what I was exactly feeling. I wasn't able to really articulate it. So maybe, me talking about it in media about some of these things might have like spurred or, or sparked someone else's thoughts to be like, oh dang, I actually kind of think of life that way. Maybe I should go and and take the next step and work on this in a preventative way instead of like a crisis emergency way. So I was able to kind of remind myself as often as I could um, that I just had a really rare opportunity to um, talk about this stuff openly. Mm -hmm. And even though when it didn't feel I felt like I, I had to use more energy to do that because I was kind of down or I was struggling with baseball, or whatever. Um, every time I came out of it, it was kind of like that idea we talked about earlier with it being like almost like therapeutic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to kind of help myself. It kind of, I realized it helped me more than it might've helped anyone that was listening right. to me. Yeah. yeah. So what ultimately led to the decision to, to retire and walk away from, from physically playing the game? Yeah, I think it was, I really, I was really struggling with the idea that baseball actually was starting to feel like work for the first time. And I say that like, and I kind of like makes my skin crawl because I, I don't like that idea because I never felt that way with baseball in my life. Like I, as, as hard as, as much of a grind it was like coming up to the minor leagues, like the lifestyle, all that, all those things. Like I complained about it at times, but like 
realistically, I, I, I always enjoyed it. I always liked to go to the field and like work on my swing, work on defense and stuff like that. Even if I was tired, like, yeah, I would complain about it a little bit just because that was part of the culture, but um, realistically it, it was fun to me. And this year I realized that like, I was starting to dread going into the cage to work on my swing, to try and make that adjustment that I thought I needed to do. Um, because again, it wasn't really until after I retired that I was able to finally give myself grace. I like, dude, you had one eye, just give yourself a break. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't your swing. Um, so, but in the moment I thought I was like fully convinced it was my swing. It was like some mechanical issue. So I didn't really have the drive to go and fix that. And I was just like, I don't know. Statistically, I'm obviously not going to make it back to the big leagues right now. Um, I don't feel like really working on it as much as I need to, or as much as I used to want to. Um, is this really starting to feel like a job to me? And then I just realized I really missed, like, I finally got, I got homesick for the first time in my life, mm. which threw, like really threw me off. Um, because I basically, I signed when I was 18 years old I just grew up on the road and grew up away from home and stuff. So I just, that's what was regular to me. But I think after my incident, I really got to see what my support system was like. I got to see what it was like to be at home for an extended period of time. Um, and really like connect with the people that I was around. Um, and I was start, really started to miss that. And again, I was just, I wasn't even really playing that much at that time. The last like two months of my, of that season, I was really only playing like at best, like once a week. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, I'm just going to ch- see, like write it out a little bit and see if anything changes. But that was a pretty consistent feeling. And at that time I was starting to talk about it with my, our team psychologist. And that's when she kind of, um, approached me with like, you know, we got a lot of players that reach out because of you and a lot of people are starting to help themselves because of you. If you do ultimately decide to do this, would you be willing to find, if we could find a way to keep you around, would you be willing to do that to try to help spread, like bridge the gap um, throughout the whole organization instead of just the AAA team? So that was also like part of the, the, the thought process too. So like, I knew that that wasn't like a for sure thing. It's just kind of talked about. So I was like, if that were to happen, I feel like I would feel more passionate about doing that at this point than I was like going in and trying to make a mechanical adjustment in a swing that wasn't because of my swing. It's just because yeah. I had, the yeah, that's so much more powerful though, man. Yeah. That is so much. Cause you're affecting so many other people in, in that decision. So did you, that conversation took place. Did you have a conversation with the GM or the organization and then decide it was time? Yeah. Just so, like I said, I was really starting to analyze it that way. And then a couple of weeks went by and I was just like, you know what, like this, this, this is just really how it feels. And I, and I genuinely feel passionate about if this opportunity, this job were to like present itself, well, like if it actually was a possibility, I feel like I would enjoy that um, just as much as if I were to go out tonight and hit two home runs. So um, I asked if that was a possibility and then they came back and said, yeah, I would be willing to. And I was just like, let's go. (laughs) Um, So I was, and I also was like aware that that's a really rare opportunity too for players. Like, Usually when a player, especially a player that signs out of high school, like it's a terrifying thing to think about the end of your career because I didn't have anything to fall back on. I didn't have a college degree, had no work experience. I was like, for the part of that, that like process of thinking about the next step while like, am I doing this for the wrong reason or am I, does this feel like work now? Um, Do I need to just walk away? Whatever. Like I was pretty convinced at one point that I was going to retire, go work at like, get a part-time job at like, just the freaking target down the street and go and commit six years to, to go to school and become a LeBron James, a therapist. So <laughs> uh, I was like thinking about that. And then, like I said, this, this opportunity presented itself. And I was just like, I am not very many people get this opportunity yeah. to have something set up immediately after they retire, mm-hmm. especially a high school signee. So I was just like, again, this, the universe is just working for me. So um, that's, that's why I took that, that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to jump into that, but just real quick, it's an interesting concept because it's the second time it's come up in the last two two conversations we've had. The the thing that you were so passionate about your whole life and that you knew that you were made to do, now all of a sudden doesn't feel that same way anymore. And that's an interesting concept to me because football, to me, was... I didn't get to walk away from it. It was quote unquote taken away from me. It was done for me before I was ready. And so it wasn't like I had that choice, but for some people like you and for Darren, you, you chose to walk away. That's just an interesting thing to me that that the passion was no longer there. It's almost a little scary to think about. It's like this thing that I'm so on fire for 
one day may not be the thing that I'm on fire for anymore. Yeah, it was confusing. Like I said, that's why it was a longer process than just like, okay, I realized this. All right, let me take the name. It was like a, a couple of weeks. It was like more than a couple of weeks, actually. Like I, I was really thinking about it because I was so confused. I was like, how? And I, I have that same thing, that same aspect happens with other things in my life, like um, outside of baseball. So like certain things just don't fire me up the way they did before. Um, but again, it's like, I, I know that I was able to have a rare opportunity to like go out on my own terms. And while it was very confusing, it was also terrifying. I was, yeah. I was terrified that I was going to get home and like a week after I, my decision be like, man, what the hell did I do? Like, I, mm-hmm. how can I walk away? Like I was terrified that was going to be the case a week or two afterwards. Um, but luckily that wasn't. And I think it's because like I was able to go out on my own terms. I got a lot out of something that like, at certain points in my career, I thought was were definitely over. So I feel like I got more than what I was necessarily guaranteed. Um, and then even more so after my incident, like being able to just even be back on a baseball field yeah. was, was icing on the cake. So um, I just, I had, I was able to kind of like reel myself in and realize I got a lot more out of it than I, mm-hmm. than I probably would have ever guessed. And then also, like I said, I, I, I got to experience a little at that time it was, it was very, surface level, but I got to experience a little bit of like possibility of maybe having impacts on other people's lives yeah. and to enjoy their life on a broad scale, not just in a baseball yeah. setting. Yeah. Uh, that seemed to kind of fire me up just as much as any home run or any good play ever did. So, okay. So talk to us about who you felt like your identity was the last time we spoke. And then what do you perceive your personal identity to be today? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I would have to really think about that, but I think I was still kind of feeling the idea that baseball, like I was a baseball player and that was like everything else is secondary, um, which I don't think is the worst thing in the world. Like, I think it's pretty mm-hmm. like for someone to commit their entire life to something, that's a really, that's something they're not going to regret. So mm-hmm. like working really hard to be a baseball player and giving my life to being a baseball player. Like, I don't think I'll ever regret that. And I don't regret it. Um, there was definitely time, other parts of my life that I wish I would have just took, gave more time to, but I think I could have done that with, while still like committing fully to baseball. So, um, if, I, if baseball would have ended the way, or if baseball would have gotten taken away from me three years before my incident, I would have been, you know, I would have been lost because at that point and up until our last combo, like, I think, I think I was just like fully committed. Like I'm a baseball player and I'm yeah. never not be. So there was that idea. And I think that now it's gotten to the point now where like baseball is a huge part of my life. And like I said, I I'm comfortable saying I committed everything to it, but um, I also have a lot of pride in being like a really good partner to Diana. I have really good. I have, I put a lot into being a good teammate at that time. Um, and also just being a really good person and, and trying to use my story in a way to like help people get to help people avoid getting to where I got to on April 16th. So I just have a couple different things that like I'm passionate about. And uh, I think my identity is just a, a pretty big boiling pot of just like being a good person, being mm-hmm. a good partner, being mm-hmm. a good friend, being a good son, like the typical things that you hear. And it feels like it's cliche at times. It feels like it's common sense, but realistically a lot of people take that those kind of titles for granted um and those are usually the most fulfilling yeah. characteristics of anybody yeah and i think what you know we've talked about it here one of the challenges with that identity was is if you associate your identity with something that could be taken away right that's really fragile right like you said baseball could be taken away but if you're associating your identity with foundational things being a good partner being a good teammate being a good friend being a good son being all those things nobody can take those away from you right? That, that's where the identity, right? That foundation is really firm. But if you're saying, Hey, yeah, like for me, that was, that was, I struggled, man. I really struggled yeah. with that. Yeah. And, it, but football got taken away like that. Like you're not good enough anymore. Yeah. You can't play, mm-hmm. you can't play at this level. And then that's where the struggle really, really goes. And, and, and then you associate, I'm not good. I am not good enough. No, no. Like I'm not playing good enough right now is a more accurate statement, right? Not, I am not good enough. Mm. Wow. That's a good distinction. Yeah. That's a really important topic. And that's something I'll definitely steal and use. In the future. <laughs> <laughs> away from me, like I said, and that's why I think I'm so passionate about, like I've said a couple of times, like walking the walk, basically. Like I have an opportunity to talk in front of audiences and to say like, 
what I do to help myself be a little bit more balanced, like emotionally and mentally along as, as, as well as physically. Um, and like I said, being a good partner, being a good friend, good son, all those things while also like walking the walk of like sticking to my routines and things that I think help me. Yeah. Like it just gives you, that's something that can't be taken away from you. Like you said. So, um, wow. and that's why, that's why I like was saying at first, I don't like really think it's the worst thing to say my identity is baseball and I commit everything to baseball because like, Although I wasn't doing it in the most healthy, like sustainable way, I don't have any regrets on the physical side of effort yeah. that I ever gave in baseball right. because I was like, I was doing it in a, like a, an obsessive, like escape type way because of, I had a bunch of things that I didn't want to deal with. And I was yeah. just like using it and like going working extra hard because I didn't want to think about anything. But at the same time, like now I don't regret the way I worked physically towards mm -hmm. baseball at all. Yeah, so yeah. Um, now I'm just trying to apply that to things that, like you said, can't be taken away from me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so now, I mean, everyone, a lot of people know your story. Are you doing speaking engagements? Are you speaking to different, to different people, to young kids? Yeah. So I've, I've slowly started to get into that too. And that's, like I said, I've said a couple of times now that that seems to give me more fuel and it kind of fires me up the same way that like, going through for four of the home run I used to do. And it's like last week I went and presented to, I went to uh, an old teammates hometown and we put together a speaking event and we had students, high school students from 18 different school districts attend. And like, that was the first time that he did it with me. And that was realistically still like, I'm pretty new to it too, but we both did that presentation. We had two more later that day. Um, and we got done with the day. Like it was a long day, but like, a lot of people get like a lot of the feedback was that you guys we, like, is there a way to do this more often? And I was like, yeah, I think so. Um, um, I'm slowly starting to get into it, but we got done with it. And my buddy texted me. He's like, dude, maybe we should run with this. That was the best day ever. And like, it's just kind of like affirming because like that, that's the way I feel. It's just like, it's such a fulfilling thing to be able to just one, just be myself. And it seems to like resonate with people. And then also like the idea that I might've helped someone start the process right. to yeah. like, getting to where I got to, like I said. So that's the whole reason why I do, um, I try to keep talking about this because ultimately the main goal is to try to help someone not get to where I got to. All right, I wanna take a quick minute to talk about our partner, Choctaw Casino and Resort. Uh, we are really, really humbled uh, and grateful to be a partner for them. If you've listened to the show for any amount of time, uh, you've heard how great the resort is there, how great the casino is, the new expansion, they've doubled in size, 3,000 new slots, they've got unbelievable sports bar, they've got unbelievable restaurants, unbelievable movie theaters, arcades for kids. It is endless, the things that they've not only improved but added. Um, but it's just, an, the, the experience that they provide is second to none. Choctaw Nation has done an incredible job with the community, with philanthropy, with support. Um, they have just done incredible things. So we are extremely humbled and grateful to partner with Choctaw Casino and Resort. Make sure, I know you know it, it's just a short drive of 75. Go check them out. And now back to the episode. Right. And that's what, dude, I love that you've recognized that through through the the tragedy, right? And through all the things that you've gone through is is that you can still be you can still be authentic right and you can still be real and you can still and recognize that hey that authenticity is is what's going to affect and impact someone right for the better and maybe like you said avoid an incident like you went through and and avoid something like that man and and i love that and i love that you're using that story and recognizing it while you're in it. Like, Hey, look, I can do something really amazing. Cause I believe man. Yeah. And, and in my, in my heart, man, in my soul, like I believe God put you yes, through the work that yep. you put in, right. The yep. obsessive, the, and he put you through a trial mm -hmm. that you overcame because you have something so much bigger than just playing in the bigs. I mean, bigger than a world series. Like I think that what you are are being groomed to do right now mm. is on a on a global scale. Not just in a sport, not just doing something like that because your story, what you can do to someone and how you can change someone's life like you did to yeah. ours, like you did to Ben's. I mean, what you can do is so much bigger than just playing a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just well, man, we just we just want to continue to encourage you, man, because 
Holy smokes, man. Yeah. Like, you, you know, something I'm curious about because like how you just like really so, sentimental moment. He's just yeah, like, just scoop right over. Yeah. It. Just no, right no, over. I was about yeah, to say, yeah, hey, go, go, go ahead, man. No, Give yeah, your thought now. It's your show, bro. That was just really go. nice. <laughs> Ty just preached, bro. He yeah. just put the word in there. Well, go ahead. it, it kind of ties into what Ty was saying, but not really. Cause I wasn't really listening, <laughs> but <laughs> he literally, I look over and, and he's just kind of like, I like when Ben thinks his eyes are kind of up, like looking past the light up here. And he's just like this. I'm like, all right, he's uh, he's zonked out. He's ready to go. Oh, I caught topic. the Holy Ghost for your time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does have to do with what you were saying. Uh, my question is, from where we last talked in this past year, because I guess my I guess the Hollywood script would say that you don't struggle anymore with mental health, no. and, and and everything's good, and you've got it all figured out now. But how has your mental health been this past year? What, I yeah. mean, is it still a struggle? Is it still something you're having to work on all the time? Or, or are you past that? What What does that look like yeah. for you now? That's what I was getting ready to after I was going to say, like, thank you so much, Ty, for all that. But I got you, bro. I was, like, getting ready to get into that a little bit because I think the authenticity part of me talking and just being vulnerable and talking to the heart is because I still deal with it. Like, I get up here and I talk about how I'm able to appreciate the good days a lot more and I'm able to kind of balance things a little more, but realistically I still have really tough mental days and like mood swings and mental disorder days. And it's just like, it's something that I've come, come to terms with and like known that and I'm starting to understand that I might have to deal with it for the rest of my life, but I try to prepare for it before it happens. So that way it doesn't feel as overwhelming. And if it does get to a point where it's really overwhelming, at least I can like shorten the window to where it's like, instead of lasting for two months or a month, it lasts for a month or two weeks. So it's like, I just try to understand and, and kind of reinforce the the good thoughts and the, the good self-talk and all these positive quotes and affirmations and things, because as I've gone through different episodes since my incident, which again, like it's happened, like the month of Jan December and January, I had suicidal thoughts again, uh, just to be completely candid. Um, I just, I have these, un, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have, I clearly have a chemical imbalance internally and it's something that I still have to work on and try to find a way to balance myself with my, my support system, my psychiatrist, my therapist, all these people that are willing to put the work in for me or with me. Um, it's something, like I said, I just, I've gone, to, I've come to terms. I might have to deal with it for the rest of my life, but at the same time, that doesn't mean it has to be that way all the time. So in the past, when things were start to get overwhelming, I would just totally give in with no fight and just like let it run, run its course and just sit there and think that the world's the worst place in the world every second of the day, think that I'm the worst person in the world and just like completely give in. But now when I go through them, I have like this little hope in the back of my mind that's like quotes that kind of like flash in my head of like nothing lasts forever, good or bad. So like that allows me to have a little bit of hope that this bad feeling is going to last forever. And then also that kind of comes into play on when things are going well, it's like, nothing lasts forever, good or bad on the good side. It allows me to appreciate the good things a little bit more because inevitably things are going to happen in the future that might throw me off my course a little bit. Um, but yeah, like I said, I just, I clearly have a chemical imbalance because I work too hard to That's counterbalance right. these things with like my, my therapy, my psychiatry work, my, um, my workouts, my dieting, my meditation, journaling, conversational things, um, community work, like all these things should allow me to, be more balanced and proud of myself. But at times I still feel, I get really hard on myself. And then sometimes that, like, again, what we talked about those momentum in the negative way oh. and before you know it, I just like, I think the world hates me and oh. I think I hate the world. And it's a, a, a two to two week to a month long battle. But again, perspective wise, like if I were to think of it percentage wise, like 11 out of 12 months, if I'm able to have 11 out of 12 months, good, like three years ago, I would be like, are you kidding? Yes, of course I'll do that. So it's oh. just like these, these things I try to remind myself before the uh, the mood swings or the the irritability and short temperedness stuff happens. So that way, it allows me to either shorten the window or make them not as severe. Maybe for yeah. someone that uh, that hasn't recognized that, hey, listen, I I may be going through some mental health challenges. I may be imbalanced. What are some What are some things that that you've seen? that you now recognize maybe that you didn't before that are like triggers or, Hey, these are signs. That, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm in a phase right now where I've got to be like, like diligent about addressing it. What are some of the things you're like, all right, be aware of this, this, and this. For me, it's like irritability. 
So like, I've always just been a short tempered person. And when I say that, I mean like short, like the smallest little things can throw me off for the next hour. Um, and at times it takes a lot of energy to reframe that into a positive way. So like, unfortunately, like the smallest little things, um, where it's like someone on the outside, like, dude, are you kidding? You're going to let that affect you. It's like, yeah, I am for some reason. That's just the way mm. my body works, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to, I'm trying to fix it. Like it didn't happen the last small thing. So it's a sign that it's actually happening. But for me, it's just like the irritability. So, um, I think the irritability usually leads to like a little bit of cold heartedness, like a little closed off to where like, I'm not as open with Diana. I'm not as open with like my, 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 like my close circle of people. And I like tend to start to isolate There is mm-hmm. not like the full blown like isolation, but like if something annoys me, I'll like literally go to the other room and just sit there for like five minutes. I'm like, all right, this is a sign that something's like starting to boil internally. And it's something that I might need to address. So that way it doesn't turn into, cause like usually the next, it usually just gets worse. So we're like, sometimes I like literally just lay in bed for the entire day. Um, and I'm just sitting there beating myself up the whole time because it's like, dude, go work out, go get outside and sound like, you know, those things are going to help you. But I'm like, no. So like the cold heartedness, the closed off, like closed minded. And then like, uh, just the, uh, stubbornness is like usually the three things for me that really are kind of like a recipe for disaster basically. Yeah. And yeah. That, usually those, show up in the most random places. Um, and for the most part, I'm starting to be a little bit more aware of them to where, like you said, I can kind of nip them in the butt before they get serious. But like I said, like in January and December, I wasn't able to. So it's, it's just something that happens every once in a while. And I think that's something that really anyone can attest to. Like who doesn't have adversity or who doesn't yeah, have like yeah. negative thoughts or negative feelings. Like the most beautiful people in the world have ugly thoughts sometimes. Yeah, so it's just yeah. like something that everyone has to deal with. And I think that's the message too, that I'm trying to like, portrays like some someone's or everyone's always dealing with something and literally anyone can benefit from like talk therapy or just like med, like some kind of like mental practice um anyone can can um benefit from even the most put together people that you yeah, that yeah. You know. man I, i'm listening to you and, and you're talking now and there's so you know ben wasn't the only one that was affected we had so many listeners that were were affected and, and my son 21 year old Jaden, lost his friend through suicide years ago and a couple of his buddies uh, had listened to your show. And one of the moms uh, wanted me to tell you this, and I forgot to tell you guys, wanted me to tell you. That's pretty to, common that like we'll hear like months yeah. and months later. Like, no, oh, yeah, no, this spo- is. No. I was supposed to tell you this. No, but this is, I mean, like, if, you know, if you ever talk to Drew, have him visualize the people that he's talking to. And you said it right now, you said it earlier that, you know, you you felt something when you went out with your buddy and you had that talk, when you had that that speech, right? sometimes in my life, Drew, I've had to visualize, and this is just a little bit of advice. I've had to visualize those positive things, whatever those positive things are. Man, you are affecting so many people by your voice alone. Yeah, you're not on the, on the, on the diamond anymore. You're not playing baseball right now, but your voice is being heard. So I want you to visualize in your mind that, little, that, that lady who's a mother of three who sat there and cried to me and said that was the best thing she's ever heard, right? Those are the people you're affecting, man. So you keep doing what you're doing, brother. It is powerful. Your words are powerful. And, and let that enlighten you and let that hopefully drive your your spirit. Yeah, man, like I said, that's, that's fuel right there. I, I, that's another thing I'm really grateful for is that with this being public, I've also had the rare opportunity where people feel comfortable that the people I don't necessarily know yep. feel comfortable like either send me messages or send me mail or something that just says like, thank you. And I, th- I think that's like something that realistically you can do that to anyone. It doesn't have to be uh, someone like me who's like trying to portray a message. It could be like something you see every day. Like just take a moment every once in a while and just be like, Hey, I appreciate you for being the friend you are. Right. I appreciate it. It's just like everyone likes to be heard or everyone yeah. likes to be noticed at times. So um, that's another rare opportunity that I'm well aware of that I have with my story being public and the, the work that I'm trying to do to stay um, in the, like in the, in the public to try to like help more people um, feel like they're, they're not alone. So that's good. Talk to us really quickly. You know, you have uh, man, so gracefully embraced vulnerability, right? Since the Mm -hmm. incident Um, and and talk about the freedom that that gives you to be able to be transparent. You mentioned, you know, on our show, it was, it was one of the, you know, the, it was up to that point, the most transparent you had been in, and, and sharing your story and your journey. 
But talk about that freedom. And, and the reason I say that is, is my wife, um, it's public knowledge, so it was out there, but we, we were the chairs of this charity dinner that, um, you know, for an organization, and she shared her story of abuse when she was a child. And just her sharing that, and it was the very first time she ever did it publicly, ever. But just in sharing that, and we had a handful of tables, there was three people three people that came up mm. and shared their story with her. Mm. And mm. when she walked away, yes, she felt like, okay, sharing this for the first time, it was a lot of weight off of my shoulders. Um, but then also being able to encourage somebody else because right. you were vulnerable. Right. And those people felt comfortable. And like you said, you know, you sharing, people feel comfortable coming up to you and, and either complimenting, encouraging, but also sharing their struggles with you. Man, the impact that you can make... Yeah being vulnerable, yeah. like people just don't comprehend that. But yeah, and back to my original question, share like the, how empowering it is actually to be vulnerable. Yeah, I just think it's something that I've realized it's gonna come out of you whether you like it or not. So like the way that you are, whatever you're harboring or whatever kind of trauma you had or whatever environment you grew up in, it's gonna come out in, in ways that you either like or not. So. Um, for me, like it came out in anger, it came out in irritability, it came out in short temperedness, it came out in like, at times like being condescending with a condescending tone towards Diana. It's like, they came out in, in ways that I didn't like, morally, I didn't believe that's who I was. But like I said, because I didn't address my emotional well being beforehand, they just came out in uncomfortable ways and at times ugly ways. So being vulnerable and like t having the awareness to like talk about the way you're feeling, the way that you're thinking about things it is, it's just like you said, it's a very freeing feeling to where, um, you get it out in a more healthy way in a more, um, growth minded way, instead of just like a reaction, like ear to like, a um, like react to stimuli in, a, in a, however way you're going to, that you're just accustomed to it with something that you just like kind of leave the chance. So, yeah. um, and you say that like those things are going to come out whether you like it or not. And I think that that's something, again, everyone can kind of um relate with because for me like i said it came out in anger but other people might come out in like alcoholism or just like yeah. all these other unhealthy habits um so for people that, like for me i've realized the best benefit of being vulnerable is that like i get to kind of either stay ahead of it or for me now that this public i actually get to like have an opportunity to like show what an example looks like of being vulnerable and what conversations around mental health and emotional well-being look like mm -hmm. instead of it having you never do it before you might think of it needs to be this like very like zen like gandhi like very um spiritual experience and like that's okay too at times but sometimes it's literally just as simple as having a conversation with someone that you have a conversation with every single day or it's it's doing something very small in a routine that you already have in place and just adding a five to ten minute habit yeah. into that routine and it's just like i said it's going to come out whether you like it or not so why not do it in a more Oh, like intention, intentional way in a way that you feel like it's going to actually benefit you. And you'll realize it benefits people around you. Like you said, for your example, your wife, a lot of other people felt comfortable. And that's what I've experienced. Like people come up to me and ask me like one specific question about my story. Like it's like just something they were curious about. And before you know, it's in like 45, 50 minutes. And we're like full on like psychodynamic <laughs> right. childhood being in like their environment and thing. I'm like, this feels good to get it off your chest, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Now go do it with a professional because I'm not trained to actually assess this. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's like, it's just, again, it's like, an, it, like I, I, I'm, I feel grateful that I'm able to like show what an example of mental health looks like. And also, and as like a male and in, in baseball specific, it's an environment that's not necessarily talked about that much and just showing that, Oh, this can be talked about while also being a really tough guy and like, grinding through life adversity and still having that grit as well, but also taking time to balance that with um, some vulnerability because I don't know, just like I said, if you don't take a break, you're going to break. And that's like, it's something that for a man's mentality, that's just something that happens. And oh. again, I kind of ramble at times, but I just think it's something that's going to come out whether we like it or not. So yeah, um, take it. the initiative and, and do it in a more intentional way. And you realize it actually is a very freeing feeling. Yeah. I know we got to wrap up soon, but one thing I did want to touch because something I'm passionate about is, is spreading the good news of physical activity and the importance of moving your body and being in shape physically. And I'm curious for you, the link between your physical health and your mental health. Talk to us about why moving your body 
getting strong, being active is so important for your mental health? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, there's just too much science, one, attached to it that it scientifically shows that, like, you get the endorphins, you get the adrenaline, all the feel-good chemicals come from working out. You also get to attach to it, like, a sense of pride, so you feel good about yourself, like, emotionally. And then it's just, like, physically, it's, like, it's literally a translation into a visual way of your hard work. Like, your body is a translation of your hard work in a visual way, so it's, like, it just shows that like, again, like you've been walking the walk, um, you've been like taking things seriously and you believe in, in being a, a good person, a healthy person. And I'm not saying like working out makes you a good person, but it's just another characteristic of someone that believes that they're important mm. and it's like that they are needed or that they are worthy of feeling good because it's just like, like I said, it's, it's scientifically proven that you feel better. Like you physically feel better after workout. Like you feel you have that drum rush, you feel good by yourself. And then you add like consistency and routine and discipline on top of that six months on the road, you just have like, it's going to lead to more self-confidence. It's going to lead to a better emotional well-being. And then you look back and like, dang, I actually committed to myself. And like, that's again, coming back to the idea of fulfillment. Like that's, that's what actual like contentment and happiness is like. Mm-hmm. And it's not like that, that pleasure seeking feeling of like, yeah, let me go work out and let me get a huge prompt. And then I won't go back for two more weeks. It's like, no, I actually committed my life to something. I had a discipline and like when I wasn't motivated, I still went and did it. And that's something uh-huh. I can be incredibly proud of. So Amen. I say that now, like as an 18 year old, I just, I wanted to have this, the sickest sick pack. Yeah. But, uh, hey, <laughs> traps no, and six pack. That's you know, all that matters. There's nothing wrong with juicy biceps. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. <laughs> I think too, like I would rather Jeez. look like me than, than some like than this being overweight. But at the same time, I do it more so for the idea that like I'm committing myself to like just a better version of myself. Yeah. And then I'm buying into the idea of discipline. And like I said, I just think your body is like a physical, like a visual translation of what you're willing to do behind the scenes. That's yeah. great. Darren, do you know no. what he calls his, uh, his garage gym, his home gym? No, but I love the shirt mentality. What, what is the garage? He, gym? he calls his garage gym Petey's pump house. Petey's pump house. <laughs> <laughs> How awesome hey, is that? Hey, we need to edit this part. <laughs> It's after dark. It's, it's only open after dark. It's part of the oh, show. <laughs> hey, Drew, I got I got one more one more question for you. And man, I know I know you're still writing your story, and and you have a lot of impact still left. Uh, yes, pump out. Look at him. There it is. <laughs> that is awesome. I if love it. it. Where did that come from? What's Petey's from? That's his nickname. Yeah, so that's my nickname. Um, kind of. It's pretty funny, like how it happened. Like the. It was like an alter ego type thing when I was younger. And when we used to um, drink a little bit more often, I would just obviously, just like everyone else, I was just a more outgoing, more goofy. And like my real, so like I just was able to be out more outgoing and I was just mm. a very like goofy person um, at heart. So I was able to do that without any kind of regrets uh, when there was alcohol involved. So, so PD would show people up. were like, you're just like a completely different person. We need to get you a new nickname. Um, <laughs> like like PD. And it was just like, Yes, that fits perfectly how goofy you are. And before I know it, like the next day, guys are calling me PD in the clubhouse. And then, like, before I know it, a couple of weeks later, like, coaches are calling me. And then a couple of years later, like, literally no one with the Rangers called me Drew. It was oh, everyone. Wow. So it was also fun because for a while, like, people started, like, the media started finding out about it. And then, like, they, it was fun. We, like, kept, like, a kind of a, a mystery where it's yeah. like, yeah, you'll never know, guys. Sorry. <laughs> it's like this fun little game that, like, the media would go and even ask their like, teammates, and they're like, "Ooh, I don't know, Drew. I don't think that he, but yeah, you just you'll never know." Type <laughs> It'd be hilarious uh, if everybody told a completely different story. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was like one person that like, kind of just caught on. So um, I just kind of crazy. That's all right. So what I was saying is, is, is I know that that you're still writing your story, you're still making an impact, um, but I've got. I've got two really serious questions that I think we're all thinking is one. So they're not going to be serious at all. Here we go. <laughs> one, you know me finally. <laughs> one is when does the full length feature film come out? And then two, who will be playing Drew Robinson? <laughs> Man, that would be pretty awesome. That would be another thing that I just would never have imagined for my life. But um, if someone had to play me, dang, I don't know. My <laughs> All right, Drew, let's be transparent. Let's not be coy about this because I know you've thought through this. You're like, all right, who's who's my top three? Who's we've, We know that. Who is it? 
It's got to be. I mean, it's got to be bit. What Ben Affleck? He's not athletic. No, enough. he's too old. He's older now. He's, <laughs> yeah. he, he's, he's like that dude can play like a seventy-year-old, like, but he can also play a thirty-year-old. No, he can't. He yeah. I mean, I would like to have Jim Carrey because he had, he gets the goofy side yeah. down. Petey, <laughs> 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 he can play Petey. <laughs> Speaking of, this is totally uh, random, but my uh, my son, my two year old son, they were he and my five year old wrestling, and he hit his head on the tile and chipped his teeth, oh. chipped his two front teeth. He looks like uh, he looks like Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber. Right now. <laughs> I have a group message where we all have different pictures of people as our avatar, and Lloyd Christmas is my avatar. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, to do it. Oh, oh man, man, that's awesome. Well, Drew, man, we really appreciate the time again. Um, this is gonna be this is gonna be a reoccurring uh, yeah. thing that we're just gonna do. I just catch up because, gosh, we love the conversation, we love the insight, uh, we love the encouragement, man. So thank you for for coming on with us, and thank you for what you're doing. And I like I said, you, you're gonna have a global impact. Uh, you're gonna use your story for something so much bigger than the, than a game. Yeah. So we just encourage you to keep pressing and. As always, man, we are here for anything that you need, any way we can help you, connect you, whatever it is, man. We're advice. Here. Here's the advice. He wasn't asking. Yeah, yeah. He, I'm going <laughs> to give it to him. <laughs> speak your bureau or an agent. You need to speak. You need to be out speaking and telling your story. <laughs> no, serious, man. It, it, it yeah. would be a shame that you're not sharpening your skill on getting out there in public and doing public speaking because you're going to affect so many people brother and i keep going back to that and i'm going to be on your ass i'm gonna ride your ass man <laughs> until you till i see you out there on the circuit yeah i'm going to um maybe the next next conversation we have but like we're uh we're really close to launching our foundation with like co-founders and i so um that'll definitely be a part of it too so yeah. the community of, of public speaking and things like that so that'll be a part of it um and my brother actually just moved to the dfw area so oh, oh, right on. And see hi and then maybe we can uh we can sit down and talk about foundation next time or just talk just catch up again absolutely love it man absolutely I love it yeah you, you got three great guest speakers right here uh, for your foundation so <laughs> 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 just kidding no man drew thank you so much like, like i said i'm gonna i'm gonna keep telling everybody when they ask the answer will never change for me as long I mean, we're gonna be doing this for 20 more years oh. the answer is never gonna change you're my favorite guest. Uh, weird time over. He's a little weird, man. <laughs> if you yeah. are still listening to this and you have not go listened back and listen to, to 105, 105. If you have not, okay, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have bring another topic on stubbornness, right? <laughs> but but go back and listen to 105. <laughs> listen to Drew's story, man. The the detail that he gets into, it's it's powerful. And then come back, listen to this, and just listen to the growth that that this man yeah. that's, that's our guest yeah. today. Has gone through, still, still fighting it. Just because you know he's he's on a platform now doesn't mean that the struggle is not there. And and I love man that yeah, you thanks acknowledge for sharing that. that, brother. Thank and, you. And uh, and talk through that, man. But appreciate you, brother. Thanks, Drew. Absolutely, appreciate you guys. Thank All right. you. Thanks, yeah. Drew. All right, man. Have a good All one. Right.